joining us at two o'clock. Thank you for uh, attending today's webinar. My name is uh, Charlie Mitchell and I'm the Features Editor here at Call Center Helper and I'm really excited to take you through uh, today's webinar on the new thinking for contact center KPIs. I have uh, two really great speakers uh, for you today and the first one is uh, Katie Stabler. How are you doing today, Katie? I'm fantastic, thank you. Good to be here. Excellent. And for all of those who are just joining us, could you give us a little bit of uh, insight about uh, what you do within the call center and customer experience industries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm director and founder of Cultivate, which is a customer experience consultancy. Um, I act as an advisory to organizations, including call centers, uh, helping them to shape and deliver their customer experience strategy and their customer experience promise. Um, again, like most, very humble beginnings. I, I worked in contact centers um, as a store clerk, very customer facing roles, which I think, you know, set the, 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 the want to continue to focus in customer experience industries. Um, and yeah, shameless plug, I have just co-authored the Customer Experience 2 book. For anybody who hasn't read that, um, it's worth a read. Excellent stuff. And yeah, really looking forward uh, to your presentation uh, today, Katie. As am I for our second speaker's uh, presentation, who is uh, Tiffany Milligan from TalkDesk. How are you doing today, Tiffany? I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. And I don't know for everybody, again, who's just uh, joining us now, if you could give us a little bit of an introduction to TalkDesk and kind of your role within the company. Sure. TalkDesk is a uh, cloud software provider for contact center solutions, ranging from uh, contact handling to workforce management, um, uh, some of the more intelligent AI kinds of things that we're working with, like agent assist, so on and so on. Uh, my role there is director of product management for our platform area. Uh, I manage the reporting services as well as some others on the platform. Excellent. Yeah. And I think both kind of uh, your kind of experience within kind of uh, that area and Katie's uh, also experience is going to make for a really interesting, a lot of really interesting uh, discussions today. Um, and we want you to get involved in that discussion too. We like to make our uh, webinars as interactive as possible. So if you could also join us in the chat room, if you're not there already, by simply going to cch.chat, uh, just type that in your browser. Or if you want more of a URL challenge, you can type that first, uh, that first longer address in of www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. And once you're in the chat room, uh, lots of extra benefits for you being there. The first one being that you can download both our speakers' uh, slides uh, so you can kind of make sure you don't miss out on any of those key learnings uh, that we that you might pick up from today's webinar. And also you can join our quiz, uh, after, which comes after Katie's presentation, which I'll come back to uh, later, but you can, the winner of that quiz will win a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates. So yeah, very worth being in there indeed. And what I like to do when I'm kind of uh, playing an attendee role in these webinars is to put uh, the webinar on one side of my screen and the chat room on the other, just so I can keep up to date with both. And I make sure that I'm not missing out on any of those, that really great information. And also if you, again, if you want to pick up and reflect on some of that information uh, at a later stage today, or maybe in the future, uh, simply go to www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded dash webinars. And those webinars will be available uh, later this afternoon. Uh, also, again, we have a second uh, bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates to give out, not just for the winner of our quiz, but for the best uh, tip or best question that's put into uh, our chat room during today's webinar. So, yeah, just make sure you put a hashtag question for a question and hashtag tip for a tip before, uh, before the uh, bits of uh, content that you put forward. And, uh, yeah, you might well be in a chance for winning that great prize. But for now, that's enough for me. Uh, it's time for uh, to listen to uh, Katie's uh, great presentation. So I'll pass the control over to you now. Thank you, Charlie. Right. Let's get the technical bit out of the way. <laughs> Okay, hopefully you should all be able to see my screen now. Yeah, perfect. There you go, thank you. So yes, customer focused KPIs are the future. Uh, so I spent two years working for Europe's second largest credit management company in a contact center. And this is where this ethos has been built from. So I'm gonna talk you through why customer focused KPIs are the future. So first of all, 
what is a KPI and why do we care? So key performance indicators give us an understanding of how our business truly operates. They measure our success, they measure our failures, they can reflect our business as a whole, or they can focus on specific departmental areas. Key KPIs are key to driving business success. But what if they drive you in the wrong direction? So KPIs can become toxic and I'd be really interested to know what your thoughts and feelings are on these and whether or not you've experienced these toxic KPIs. So when would a KPI become toxic? Well, it may be when there is a contradiction between the actual performance of your business versus what the numbers are telling you. You may be mindlessly chasing numbers. So by this, I mean, why are you using KPIs? What are they for? Um, are you just looking at the number? But what is behind it? KPIs can also become toxic when they stop becoming indicators and they start becoming targets. So it's in the name, key performance indicator. It's not your target. So you have a target and your key performance indicator is what is going to help you achieve that and tell you how close or how far away you are from that. And as example may be, you may have a target or a goal to improve your customer satisfaction ratings. And it's likely that a faster, more effective call may well lead to an improved customer satisfaction rating. But if you're so focused on the speed of managing this call to the point where actually, you know, agent efficiency starts to dwindle and agents feel hurried and the, the pace is just all wrong, then you may succeed in getting a faster call, but you're not going to succeed in your overall goal of increasing customer satisfaction. So always be cautious, indicator, not a target. They also become toxic if they are not informing decision making. So this links back to mindlessly chasing numbers. But if you have 20 KPIs, but you're only using two of them to actually change anything in the business, then what are the other 18 doing? You know, they have to be there for a reason. And they can also become toxic when they're imbalanced, which is something I will talk to you about in, a, in just a moment. But first, poll time. Excellent. Thanks, Casey. I'm just going to launch a poll on ev uh, for everybody just on uh, just on that slide that you just showed there. And I want absolute honesty from uh, everybody watching this. And it's multiple answers, so pick as many as are relevant to you. But if you could just put, uh, let us know if uh, your organization has fallen victim to any of the following toxic behaviors. And as Katie kind of briefly went through there, those options are uh, having contradictions between actual performance and your number, chasing numbers without really knowing why, using KPIs as, tar as targets and not indicators, tracking KPIs uh, that don't form in decision making, and uh, having a set of KPIs that are in balance. So I think this will be uh, really interesting to find out here, uh, everybody's responses. Let's give everybody a couple more moments to fill that in. And I will end the polling and uh, share the results with everyone. And as you can see, there is a lot of these mistakes are very common and uh, it's great that everybody was uh, so honest with sharing that with us. Um, as we can see that the most common uh, mistake there was uh, using KPIs as targets and not indicators, which 56% uh, of the contact centers uh, surveys did, which I think is very interesting. Uh, also chasing numbers without really knowing why and tracking KPIs that don't inform decision making were also quite common. Katie, is there any surprise for you there? No, no, unfortunately not. Um, it is, it's, it's, yeah, history. It's been there, done that. It's a shame that it's still happening, um, but it is the nature of the beast when it comes down to um, people having objectives. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting uh, finding. So I'll pass back over to you now to let you, uh, let you carry on. Thank you. So we know what a toxic API is. I think we've all just um, seen that we're all um, uh, subject to them. But how can we avoid them? So how can we get over having toxic KPIs? And my guidance is one, a balanced scorecard approach, and two, think customer. And I'm gonna tell you why. So firstly, the balanced scorecard. Um, if anybody hasn't seen this before, or it's um, you know just resurfacing, then just to let you know, the balanced scorecard, it first popped around in the Harvard Business Review in 1992, I believe. Don't test me on that. So it's been around a while and it had its moment of fame and some organizations have really continued through with it, others not so much. Um, basically, it translates your strategic objectives to your performance measures. So it's fantastic when we're talking to KPIs because obviously KPIs are performance measures. 
and it complements what are traditionally the most common used KPIs. So financial KPIs are the most traditionally used and the most common. Um, but the balance scorecard brings in uh, measurements on customers, learning and growth and internal processes to bring you a more rounded and a more uh, holistic approach to performance measurement. Now, to give you a little bit of an example, um, these are all, I'm sure, very common KPIs that you've all seen before. Um, and I've just popped them into each category. So you can see how the balance scorecard would work and where these KPIs fit. And if you are taking a very balanced approach to performance measurement, then you should have, you know, uh, around the same amount of KPIs within each section. And they should all have the same emphasis on them as well. So it, again, it, going back to an earlier point, it doesn't matter if you have five financial KPIs, five customer KPIs, if actually they're not doing much, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but what happens is when you are looking at a balanced scorecard approach, it does, of course, have to be balanced. And unfortunately, customer KPIs tend to be incidental. So most organizations have them. Most organizations have them incidentally when in fact they should be entirely intentional. And here is why. So the more your company attention is focused on what outcomes are important to your customer, the better your company will likely perform on outcomes important to the business. And it is as straightforward as that, but it takes a lot of thinking to get there. Customers are your most important asset. It, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that by focusing on your customer outcomes, you will in turn reach all of your business outcomes. And why? So let me start with an example. You may have many organizational goals. In there, I would hope that there is something customer related. So I put an example here that your organizational goal may be to have happy, satisfied, and most importantly, retained customers. You want them to keep being your customer. So what customer outcomes do you need to achieve to get to your organizational goal? So we are here now. So your customer outcomes may be that they want the call answered promptly. They want a friendly agent. They want to share their personal or account details just the once. You know, if you're going through multiple channels or speaking to multiple people, customers do not want to keep repeating themselves. Customers definitely want to be listened to. They want ease of journey, no matter what channel you're on. And customer ease is something if you um, are linked in with me on social networks, you will see I bang on about over and over again. Ease is important. Um, and of course, the solution should be provided. So going back to that um, uh, controversial first time resolution rate. But they are customer outcomes. What customer KPIs would you have to measure those outcomes? And this is where it starts to get really interesting. So you, these are just some examples, but you may look at average call answer time. Now, actually, the science between average call answer time is that customers are willing to wait a little bit longer than you might expect, as long as they get the good outcome that they're after. Friendly agents, a KPI could be that your customer agent rating is high, that your quality assurance friendliness measure is high. You also want to perhaps look at a KPI which is related to your omni-channel experience and your multi-agent experience. Customers feeling listened to, how do you measure this through a quality assurance measure? Are we telling our agents that making a customer feel listened to is important? Ease of journey, customer effort score. Customer effort score is basically how easy your customer is telling you it was to have an experience with you. And then the first time resolution. But what does this mean in a wider context? Because these are all customer focused KPIs. And going back to what I said earlier, it's important to have a balanced scorecard approach. But the point of having customer focused KPIs is that they actually have huge ripple effects across the rest of your KPIs. So let's look at high CSAP and high customer effort score. If these are great, you are likely to have high customer retention, which equals high customer lifetime value. So the longer your customer is your customer, the financially better it is for your organization. That goes into the financial sector of the, the balance scorecard. You would also get high employee net, uh, net promoter scores. So if you've got a happy customer, it's a brilliant cycle of happy customer, happy employee, goes back to happy customer, it leads to reduced turnover levels for your staff, um, and of course, higher retention levels for your customer. High quality assurance rates, uh, sorry, high quality assurance scores as well. 
So if you have skilled agents, the likelihood is, is that your overall efficiency is higher, again, a cost saving measure. And overall, if all of these KPIs are achieved, your customer is less likely to contact you again. So overall, reduced contact time. It might not be that holy grail of the average call handling time, but your overall customer contact is likely to reduce if you get all of these right. So a very simple guide that you can take away to look at your KPIs and understand if they are balanced is this. So first of all, you want to look at your organizational goals. They should always be leading your KPIs. And then we're looking at a balanced scorecard. Now I'm putting customer first and I'm a customer experience expert. So of course I'm going to. That isn't to say it is the most important. It should be balanced, but customer does need to move up from where it currently is in the incidental realm. So you need to look at your KPIs relating to customer, relating to your internal processes, relating to your learning and development and innovation, and of course, relating to your financial KPIs. And then it's important to collaborate. So your balanced scorecard is actually a top down approach, starting with your organizational goals. But everybody in your organization impacts your KPIs in some way. So you need to collaborate, you need to work with your teams, not in silos. Everybody needs to understand and value the KPIs and know what they're working towards. And then KPIs are not static. So you need to review them constantly. You need to work with them. You need to use them to develop your organization. You need to adapt them when they need adapting. And that is how you will grow. Now, if I had to recommend your absolute customer must haves, it would be these. First time resolution. So whoever doesn't like first time resolution, talk to me. <laughs> first time resolution is key. Customer effort score is so important. Just think of yourself as a customer. How many times do you have experiences where the organization just doesn't make it easy? Um, I had an experience with Bose recently where they had a brilliant warranty policy, but trying to access that warranty as a customer, absolute nightmare. Ease, 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 make it easy. Channel hopping as well. So if you um, see multiple, uh, one customer hopping through multiple channels, there's something wrong there. So why are they doing that? Why is there a need for them to go down different avenues? And of course, customer satisfaction score. Overall, you want your customer to be satisfied. So going back to what I said earlier, and if I had to leave you with anything, this would absolutely be it. The more your company's attention is focused on outcomes important to your customer, the better your company will be to perform on outcomes important to your business. And that is me. So if you'd like to find out more about myself or that discussion, then please feel free to contact me. And we also have an experience recovery workshop coming up uh, in October. So if anybody would like to join us on that, please do. Excellent. Great. Thank you for that, Katie. Lots of really great stuff there. I'm just going to take over uh, my screen so everybody uh, can see that very quickly. And uh, yep, here you go. Um, just uh, in one or two words, everybody, if you could quickly write in the chat room, what did you like best about uh, Katie's presentation? It's really uh, great for, uh, it would just be really great to hear your, your thoughts on that uh, discussion, what we just had. Um, but yeah, I, I made loads of really helpful notes. There's lots of things that I personally took away from uh, your presentation, like using KPIs as an indicator and not a target, I think was a very key message that you uh, started off with. I really like the kind of balanced scorecard idea and kind of splitting your metric and in, metrics into four key areas. And uh, once your message that once you reach key customer outcomes um, you'll reach many of your other targets um, as a kind of knock-on effect was interesting and I really liked the kind of idea of kind of channel, tra tracking channel hopping as a metric I think it's it's uh, it's an important metric but not one that gets much kind of airtime so to say but yeah so that was really great to hear lots of uh, lots of brilliant takeaways there uh, but now quickly we're going to uh, jump across to our uh, our quiz Today, um, for everybody who is not yet in our chat room, I'll just give you this quick opportunity to go to cch.chat to take part and use those A, B, C, D bu uh, buttons that you'll see at the bottom uh, of your screen to do so. I will just pull the quiz across for everybody, uh, for everybody to see there. I'll make it a bit bigger on my screen for everyone. 
excellent stuff. So I'll let you I'll give you a couple more moments um, to log in uh, to do that. Also, one other point that I forgot to um, say that I really liked from your presentation, Casey, was uh, your point on um, the fact that everybody in your team impacts your KPIs. So making sure that you kind of collaborate around them. That was another point that I really took away from that. As so, yeah, lots <laughs> lots of points that I took away. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I see that we already have 100 people in the uh, chat room ready for the quiz. So let's get going with this uh, and start it off. Uh, so the first question that we have for you today is true or false? Occupancy is a good KPI for assessing agent productivity. And if you logged in slightly earlier, you would, might have heard us having, uh, uh, having a little discussion um, about this metric. So you might have had a slight giveaway as mm -hmm. to the answer there. But uh, yeah, we'll just give you a moment to... Uh, quickly uh, log your answers in. Uh, true or false, quite a simple uh, simple scoring scale. Maybe not a simple question, but we'll find out. Excellent. I'll give everybody a couple more moments to fill that in. And I'm pressing next. And yes, most people uh, did get that one right, which is really great to see. Uh, the correct answer was false. And the reason is that occupancy figures are a measure of how successful your staff and calculations have been in their way. Are they an indicator of how well your uh, advisors are actually working? So I think that's a really great teaching, that one. Um, so we have Alex in the lead currently as we move on to our next question. Uh, which is which of the following KPIs is considered very important by the most contact center professionals? Is it A, customer effort, B, first contact resolution, C, net promoter score, or D, quality scores? And this research actually comes from a uh, 2019 call center helper uh, report, uh, which, we, uh, yeah, which we made uh, in autumn last year. Excellent. So I can see lots of answers coming in now. So I'll quickly, uh, quickly move on. And yes, it, wow, it's really impressive to see that uh, a lot of people getting that right. Good to hear that. Pe good to see that people are reading my reports, <laughs> which is great. Um, and yeah, the reason for that is 68.8% of contact center professionals consider FCR a very important metric, almost double the percentage that feel uh, the same way uh, uh, about MPS. And uh, that's interesting considering the MPS conversation we had earlier too. Uh, so Simon is uh, now in the lead as we move on to our next question. And uh, this, you might have seen the acronym in Katie's slides of CES, but we want to know which metric is commonly abbreviated to that CES. Is it A, customer efficiency score, B, customer emotion score, C, customer engagement score, or D, customer effort score? I think this, yeah, quite all answers are quite similar. So this might one might be tricky. Uh, but yeah, most people again getting that one right with their D customer effort score, which is great to see. And uh, yeah, so the customer effort score derived from Harvard Business Reviews, a well-known article, "Stop Trying to Delight Your Customers," which revealed that when we lower effort, we can improve customer satisfaction. So we, Simon is still in the lead now. Uh, it's very close in between Simon and Kelly there as we come into the last question, uh, which is which famous writer once says, if the metrics you are looking at aren't useful in optimizing your strategy, stop looking at them. Was it A, George Eliot, B, Leo Tolstoy, C, Mark Twain, and D, Oscar Wilde? That actually links in very well to a point that Katie made <laughs> in her presentation. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, how many people know this one. This is a bit, this I think is the most difficult question. So it will be interesting to see. And Excellent. And uh, C, Mark Twain. Uh, that was uh, very much showing that that was the most difficult question there. Um, and another great, great Mark Twain quote is continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. I think half of the world's most famous quotes are from Mark Twain. <laughs> it's been even metrics now, apparently. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, Aaron is uh, today's winner of the uh, quiz. So congratulations, uh, Aaron. We'll be in touch soon after the webinar with a uh, bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates. So congrats again. But uh, that's enough of the quiz for now. Thanks everybody for uh, taking part, but we're gonna quickly switch over to uh, find out your top tips and uh, questions for our panelists in the chat room. Uh, so today our first tip comes from Alex who says, protect engagement and avoid overwhelm. 
keep your KPIs clearly split based on your reporting levels. Only drive a agent controllable metrics within the call center. Leave others like ASA and occupancy for the leadership team. Is this a tip that you'd very much agree with, Katie? Yeah, I think particularly that second bit is, is great advice. And not necessarily that leave it to the leadership team. Um, I'm sure it does. It's important to collaborate on KPIs, but, you know, it's also important to use the something like a racing model. So, you know, who is accountable, who is responsible, who is informed and who is I forget what C stands for, but <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. The leadership team should be accountable for those. Excellent. Yeah, I really like that kind of uh, the kind of model almost of the accountability that you presented there. I think that's really interesting. Um, our next tip is uh, from uh, Peter. He says toxic KPIs are those that encourage behaviors uh, that are not conducive of great customer experience. I'm sure this is something that you would also go along with, uh, Tiffany. Yes, absolutely. I, I have encountered many times in my past where I've uh, received questions such as, what is my agent service level? Uh, which is not a, a metric that can be controlled. That is a toxic KPI, should not be used and should not be focused on for an agent performance metric. Yeah, I think as you say, service level is a very interesting metric in terms of being kind of confused. And I know you're going to talk a lot about uh, that later, so I'm not going to kind of stomp on your territory there. Um, but yeah, I think that's a very, that's a very interesting point. Um, so another question now and from Alex. Uh, it'll be great to hear your, both of your thoughts on this one, maybe. It's, and that is, what would the optimal number of KPIs be for a standard agent? And what would the most important ones be to you? I guess kind of maybe, Casey, you've already uh, explained the second part, but what are your thoughts on maybe the first part? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there should be an optimal number. You know, I, I don't think that that should be something that is in the forefront of an agent's mind either. You know, what should always be in the forefront of an agent's mind is that they are able to, they are supported to, they are empowered to provide a good customer experience. And as long as that is what they are focusing on, the KPIs, they will be achieved. They'll be there in the background. But I'd hate, I just hate the thought of agents just constantly thinking like service time, average handling time, call wrap up time. It's just, it, like someone just said in the previous uh, message, it's, it's not conductive to good customer experience or a good agent experience. Yeah, yeah, I think as you say, it's quite, it's quite funny, the image of just kind of a advisors counting how many KPIs that they're, they're responsible for. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a really good point. Um, now, another question uh, that's coming in from Natalie is, do you feel that MPS and CSAT really inform a business on what they're doing well and or not so well? How do you make an MPS score more actionable for change? I think it we heard a bit from you earlier from this, but Tiffany, I don't know if you have any kind of thoughts on MPS and CSAT. Um, I do. I, I do think that CSAT can inform business. Um, most often, you'll be receiving more detailed scores that compile your, your final score. That's the one that usually gets communicated, but the details in the individual questions on CSAT can be quite helpful in terms of knowing where to focus to improve that customer satisfaction. Uh, NPS, a little more tricky. It's a single question. Um, that's a little bit harder to pinpoint. I know that at TalkDesk, we actually request comments. Um, and so oftentimes the comments that we receive along with the NPS response are very informative to know where to focus to improve that customer experience. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a really good point, and I I do very much kind of see what you're saying in terms of kind of it's, it's much more difficult with NPS because it is that set question, and with CSAT there is a bit much more flexibility to that. So yeah, really interesting, uh, really interesting stuff there. Uh, we have an opinion in from uh, Gabriel now who says uh, I think it would be worth relating KPIs with KPOs to avoid confusing KPI targets. I've not actually heard of KPOs. I've heard of KPA. Uh, KPA before, but never a KPO. I don't know, Katie, if this is something you've come across. It isn't. I'm, I'm, my mind is reaching to key performance objectives, perhaps. Uh, maybe, yeah. Potentially. Um, let us know more, Gabriel. Yeah, yeah. I think I've heard of uh, key performance uh, KPAs as uh, key performance areas, so maybe objectives are the same thing. Have you, have you come across that one, uh, Tiffany? I haven't. I, I'd be yeah. interested in understanding more about that as well. Yeah, this is very interesting. Yeah, Gabriel, if uh, if uh, you're in the chat room, it'll be great to uh, great to hear what uh, KPO uh, your interpretation of KPO stands for. Um, yeah, so another question that we have now in is from uh, Deborah, who says, "How do you balance an operations KPIs with uh, with uh, WFM 
uh, KPIs. Um, but I don't know what your thoughts are on this one, Katie. Um, I might hand this one over to Tiffany because I don't know what <laughs> UFN means. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'm not quite sure how we're defining operations KPIs. Mm -hmm. um, if we're trying to define that as maybe some financial KPIs or some customer experience KPIs like Katie talked about, um, for purposes of my answer, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, refer to them as the contact center operations, which is agent performance metrics um, and the what I refer to as Q metrics. Um, the, the relationship between the two is very heavily linked. So with your WFM, I'll talk a little bit about this in, in the presentation I'll be doing today. Uh, your WFM KPIs are meant to optimize your staffing, your planning, your hiring, and your scheduling. Um, those metrics are driven by the operational uh, actual values that the agents are doing. So when agents reach their particular uh, thresholds or targets or whatnot range, which I'll talk about again, um, then that lines up with your WFM KPIs. So it's something of an inherent balance. Mm, yeah, I think there's lots of uh, interesting points there. I think obviously, although kind of Deborah's maybe kind of split her KPIs very uh, differently, as you say, I think there's lots of WFM KPIs that maybe the uh, contact center team and advisors need kind of a knowledge of, especially maybe if you're putting it up on wall boards or dashboards, otherwise you'll just serve to kind of maybe confuse them. But obviously teaching um, advisors about metrics like adherence is very important. Um, so and taking them through some power of one training is very well I mean your WFM team I'm sure well, thank you lots for that um, but uh, you made lots of references to your presentation that's about to come up Tiffany so I think now is probably the perfect point to hand over to you and uh, let you uh, let you share your presentation all right hmm. Sorry, one moment. No problem. Here we are. Perfect. All right, today I want to spend a little bit of time focusing in on service level and looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, my experience over the last couple of decades in the context center industry uh, leads me to believe that it's not well understood so it's commonly the most frequently used metric, yet the least understood metric. So I want to take a closer look at that and how we should be uh, looking at service level and working with service level. So the first question is, what does service level really tell you? Uh, most often, we're just interested in keeping that service level in the green, right? Uh, what I find is oftentimes we have agents who are very good at what they do. They get promoted to team lead. They're very good at being team lead. They get promoted to supervisor, but no one ever really tells them anything about what service level is, why we have it, anything other than just keep it in the green. So really what service level is, what service level is telling you at a glance is, are you losing money? So you have an optimal range here for your service level where if you have a service level that's too high, you're actually losing money. And that's where a lot of people go, oh, well, I hadn't thought about it. All of the things that I see is keep it above 80%, right? But if you're sitting at a pretty consistent 100% service level, you're overstaffed. You're, you're paying your agents to watch YouTube videos or, or the latest viral video. Um, I think we're more familiar with the, if your service level is too low, we're looking at a poor customer experience and potentially lost revenue. So rather than looking at it as keeping it in the green, we really need to look at it as this is the optimal place to be when we're providing our customer support. Where can we balance the, the customer experience with the most cost effective or efficient way that we can provide that experience? And that's where service level brings together all of those metrics to give you a very quick glance at whether or not you're in a good optimal operating range. So, why? Why does service level give this information to you? And we talked a little bit about um, these WFM KPIs. Um, the inputs that go into WFM, we're looking at arrivals, what your abandons or abandon rate is, how long it takes to actually handle a call, 
So your actual talk time, hold time, your ACW time, which is your average handle time. We're taking a look at shrinkage. What kind of absences do we have? What kind of unavailable time do we have for breaks, trainings, meetings, so on. And then occupancy, which we talked about earlier, can't be controlled by the agent. But we also need to take that into account when we look at our forecast, excuse me, forecasting and scheduling, because if your occupancy rate is too high, you will burn out your agents and your attrition will go up. If your agents are on the phone every minute of the time that they're on shift and not on break, they'll burn out, right? So having these metrics as the input into your forecasting and your scheduling shows up when we have variances in these metrics. It shows up in your service level. So if we think about it as a mathematical equation, we put all of these things into the WFM system and we said we want our service level to be, and I will just use 80%, right? And so we have all of those things then. It comes back, it tells us, okay, get this many agents, have this many agents available during this period of time, here's their schedule. And then what we find is if we do this, and these numbers are correct or close to correct, our service level will be 80%. But as soon as we begin to see variance, shrinkage impacts the number of agents that you have on staff. If their average handle time is longer or shorter, um, it impacts this equation and you'll begin to see that service level move. So that's why service level is this indicator. So what is the real service level goal? We always talk about service level goals. Well, what's your service level goal? Well, the real goal is to keep your service level in the optimal range. And by that, we're talking about the most, again, the most cost-effective manner to provide the best customer service that you can. And that happens within a range. At some point, you're going to hit a point of diminishing returns right, where if you shave off just two more seconds off this AHT, well, restraining it mass there, and that's not really worth it. So you do have an optimal range there to operate in. Now, if your variance, like you see here on the left, is quite large, you're having a very big swing in your service level over a period of time, and I'm not talking just intraday, I'm talking uh, historically over time. If you're seeing a lot of variance, you're losing more money. If you're able to lower that variance, like we have here on the, on the right, um, then you'll get closer and closer to being able to run that contact center most efficiently with the best results for your customer. So we're gonna take a time out for a quick poll. Oh, sorry about that, I was on mute. Excellent stuff there, Tiffany. I'm just gonna launch the uh, poll that you uh, would just uh, just just introducing there and that poll is how did you set your service level targets and i think we'll definitely see some uh, interesting answers here and so the four choices are using classic standards such as kind of 80 answering 80 percent of calls in 20 seconds uh, by comparing your targets to other contact centers in your sector uh, by researching customer behavior and abandon rates or uh, the final option is not sure and uh, I don't know, Tiffany, while everybody's putting their answers in, if you have any kind of expectations, what you might see here. Um, I, I do, but I'll, I'll wait to share. <laughs> <laughs> Taking the very safe option there, but I can't blame you. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So I'll just share the results with everybody there. And we have 47% by, by using classic standards, uh, such as the 80-20, 13% uh, by comparing targets to other contact centers in your sector, 22% by uh, researching customer behavior and abandon rates, and 18% aren't sure, which I think is an interesting finding in itself. So yeah, I'll pass back over to you with those results, uh, Tiffany, now. Thank you. Um, I'm actually not surprised to see uh, that first one as the primary case. Again, we, we have that situation where people start out as agents and work their way up through the contact center into management positions and so on, which by the way, I think is brilliant. Uh, the contact center industry is probably the only one where you can actually start in as an agent and develop an entire career, not just in contact center, but also in contact center related areas. So software, for example, um, or uh, coaching or uh, product management, um, all kinds of things that you can get into as a result of just starting as an agent in contact center. But oftentimes, like I mentioned before, we're not necessarily taking a look at 
why we're measuring what we're measuring. And that's really important. So here we go. First thing we need to do is we need to measure our service level correctly. So we understand that the service level is very critical in terms of measuring whether or not we're operating within that window of efficiency, that, that optimal range there, which means money, right? And money is always a really sensitive topic. And it's especially sensitive when we're on a budget for how many agents that we can hire. And, um, you know, we get a lot of people who, again, may or may not understand the purpose of service level, what it really means. And so you'll see a lot of times people get incentivized on service level. You'll get your bonus if you keep your service level at X or above. Um, I've seen BPO contracts written so that um, everything is based on keeping a particular service level. So of course, BPO has incentive to make that number look good. Everyone has incentive to make that number look good, which means that we find lots of variations on how people prefer to calculate service level. Um, I find that this is the most accurate measure to do this, where you're taking a look at only those contacts that were answered within the wait time threshold. No abandons, no could have answered within, nothing like that. You either did or did not answer this within the wait time threshold, and you're taking that over your arrivals minus your short abandons. A short abandons, some people choose to include, others choose not to. I find it more useful to not include them because short abandons, generally speaking, you don't have opportunity to pick up those calls. Um, so that's why I have a tendency to exclude them. If you define things in different ways, you will have to balance it with a different metric in order to get a true picture of what's happening in your contact center. So I've seen some calculations where they will say, well, we count it as within service level if it was abandoned within service level because we could have answered it had the customer not abandoned. Okay, but what that means is that you can have a really, really high service level and a really, really terrible abandon rate. And that doesn't give you that balanced picture. You have to make sure you're looking at both. But very infrequently do I see someone saying, we're going to provide you a bonus if you have a really good service level and a really low abandon rate they're not taking that balance into consideration. So my recommendation really is to use a correct, I call correct, a correct measurement for service level. Yes, it may come out with numbers that aren't nice, uh, especially if you know we're prevented from doing hiring and staffing in the way that we want to, but that does provide argument back to say, we can't move this metric unless we have these things in balance, which includes additional staff. Second recommendation, calibrate your wait time threshold. So this goes back to the, how are you measuring your service level? Industry standard, 80-20, 90-30. I constantly have people asking me in the office, what's the industry standard service level? The answer is, there isn't one. There isn't an industry standard. Your service level needs to be based on what your company wants to accomplish and how your customers um, how, I would say, I guess, how long your customers are willing to wait, but that doesn't quite sound right. Again, it's that balance between that efficiency and that customer experience. So don't just use an 80-20. Don't just use a 90-30 or something else. What I recommend is going in, taking a look at your data, and using your average time to abandon. If you can set your wait time threshold prior to, before your average time to abandon, that's a better service level target than picking something out of the air that says 20 seconds or 30 seconds. An even better method would be to actually go in and take a look at the time to abandon. Take a look at that histogram. See where a lot of this is falling out because we know that average can be skewed, right? If you get a specific spike or it's a hard month or something like that, you've got seasonality, maybe not the best representation. So go in, take a look at the spread and then find out where it is you want to put that particular threshold. I do recommend that you compare that against CSAT or NPS if you can find a decent correlation or pattern between the two. Obviously, we talked about NPS being a single question. Doesn't always mean it's because my NPS is low because you didn't answer my call in time. But if you're comparing the two where you're looking at your, um, your wait time threshold against your CSAT and you're seeing any kind of movement there that you can correlate, I recommend that you balance against that as well. 
Recommendation number three and number four, we'll get to you guys are already doing this because you're contact center professionals. Um, to, to help with your service level, again, we go back to that input on, on the WFM metrics and the staffing and everything. So, Oh, I think, uh, I think Tiffany's, uh, cam cam oh, oh, am I back? There we go. Yeah, you're back. Sorry, Tiffany, to cut you off. Uh, I'm back. Apologies <laughs> for that. Um, so decrease your demand, which is your arriving contacts, your arriving volume. So the way that we do this is with self-service, right? We do self-service IVR. If you do uh, omni-channel chat bots are a great way to do that. Um, I know when I worked at uh, eBay for many, many years in their data and reporting area, um, going through on on their website through the contact us page they direct you through a whole bunch of different questions before they finally put you into a web form where actually it sends an email in so self-service don't even have to get to the queue next one call deflection um, i i experience this when i i have a, an outage with my utilities i call in and instead of waiting to say why is my power out and when will it be back on they've put a message, a greeting right at the beginning that says, we're aware of the outage in your area. We expect the power will be back on in two hours, right? That's a mechanism for doing call deflection. Um, a third one that some people may or may not consider is what I refer to as managing upstream. What I mean by this is if you're noticing that you're getting a lot of transfers in from another area, so they're hitting your queue and you need to manage the staff for that, trace back why. Why are all of those calls being transferred? And maybe that team needs better training. Uh, maybe the IVR options above are leading to a bad area. Those need to be rerouted to different specialties or something. So take a look at upstream and see if there's something that you can do to decrease the arrivals into your queue. Fourth, increase your supply, which of course is your agent hours. And this is where we all come into managing those agent metrics, right? These agent metrics here impact what's happening with those other metrics that are with the WFM system, those staffing and planning metrics. Manage your absenteeism as much as you possibly can. Of course, agents are responsible for their own availability. If they're supposed to be on the phones, they need to be on the phones. So if your agent availability is 50%, find out why. If that's not one of the things that you took into consideration for your forecasting and trying to come up with that optimal, uh, optimal number, find out why. Do what you can to change that. Um, adherence, of course, so we're talking about with availability, you're supposed to be on the phone. Adherence is when you're supposed to be on the phone. Let's not schedule meetings first thing Monday morning after we've been closed on the weekend. Probably a really, really high time when you'll get a lot of volume in there. And if you have folks that are going on break, coming back a little late, arriving late, right, that's really going to impact that, especially in those really busy times. Average talk time. This is a tricky one. Katie mentioned this in her presentation as well. Yes, it's good to, to optimize average talk time in some cases. If you're operating in a contact center where it's, not, um, what am I trying to say? Some contact centers you have very heavy relationship based. Usually that's B2B. You have an assigned account manager and that is the person that you interface with on a regular basis. And maybe if you're not available, maybe that flows to a backup with a, a more general contact center. That, it doesn't matter. Your talk time doesn't matter there because what you're focused on is actually maintaining that relationship, whether it takes a, a quick two minutes to say, yep, got it taken care of, or it takes two hours to solve a problem. That's the focus. So make sure that you're matching your, your average talk time goals to exactly what it is that you're trying to accomplish. If that's not the target of your inbound contact center, it's more just regular calls coming in like that, that's a better time to focus in on the average talk time. But again, as Katie mentioned, be careful. I have a friend who was doing some consulting, was walking on the floor and heard an agent say, I've been talking to you for too long. Could you please hang up and call back in? Be careful with this one. It's a good tool, 
if you use it correctly. And then finally, ACW, of course, anything that we can do to optimize that, if we can have automations, if we can have the ability for an agent to be taking notes and populating some things in CRM or other systems while they are handling that contact, that helps to reduce that ACW time. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. This is, this is a lot of fun. Excellent. Great. Thank you for that, Tiffany. Again, lots of really great uh, points there, and I've made a note of uh, a few of my really key takeaways. Uh, starting off, obviously, with the kind of uh, the service level part and kind of the, the root being the real goal for service level um, is to keep your uh, service level in the optimum range and variance. And I've just seen that uh, somebody's quickly launched a poll on the screen, and that's for everybody. Uh, now I'll just uh, sorry to cut, cut me off in uh, the middle of uh, my uh, middle of my uh, takeaways there. Um, I'll just share my screen with everybody too. Um, and that's if you want to see a demonstration of talk desks uh, of talk desks, any of talk desks uh, solutions, um, the, the dashboards and the cloud solutions, everything like that, which can really help you uh, align your metric strategy. Um, yeah, so if you just quickly put uh, whether you'd like to see a demo of that or not, uh, but quickly getting back to the key, my key takeaways from your presentation, Tiffany. Um, so that I thought in service that was really key. Also, your point around uh, having promoted staff kind of question, um, question why, uh, question why they're they're measuring the. Um, why the measures, the metrics that they're using and really questioning the reasons behind that um, to understand more of their role. I think it was a very good point and kind of measure and your points around measuring service level correctly and calibrating a wait time threshold was very interesting. So yeah, lots of really, uh, lots of key uh, takeaways there. Um, so uh, just another quick point um, that also, if you're interested, uh, TalkDesk are running another webinar uh, with, uh, uh, with Dennis now, a fireside chat it is uh, on building a model for CX greatness. And Dennis was uh, played a key role in kind of all Disney's uh, CX uh, strategy. So I think that'll be a very interesting one. And Beth uh, will leave a link in the chat room if you're interested in, in, in registering for that. Uh, but back to this webinar. And uh, we're now looking at some of the uh, top tips and questions that were sent in during Tiff Tiffany's presentation. And um, a tip sent in from Alex. Uh, was to engage staff in creating their own shift patterns, especially uh, with work from home. Uh, set some really simple guidelines around what the minimum requirements are, and as long as they're met, you'll have a better engaged and more loyal staff. I don't know what your thoughts are on this uh, on this tip, Tiffany. Um, I agree. Um, I think we all know that we have fluctuations throughout the day or throughout uh, certain periods of time during the week or or a month even. You can't always be chasing optimal, uh, optimal service level at every minute of every day. And so being able to stay within that range that we talked about, this is perfect to be able to do that. And, and absolutely, it will engage your employees better and, and keep them more satisfied. Great tip. Excellent. Yeah, and I, I've uh, just come across the uh, next tip now has caught my eye, and that's uh, from Gabriel, uh, who's responding, uh, obviously, to our discussion about what KPO uh, stood for. And he did say that it did stand for, as Katie suggested, the uh, key performance uh, objective. Uh, and the KPI is not a target, but a, a KPO is. So I think, uh, I think that's just settled the debate from earlier. Uh, but we have a question in now from Lana, who says that uh, with respect to Katie's point, that customers are willing to uh, wait a bit longer if they receive a good outcome. What is a reasonable SLA? Uh, try, trying to constantly achieve, achieve uh, the typical 80-20 can distract from focus on actual customer experience. So this is a very uh, tricky question to answer, Tiffany, but I'm going to put this over to you. Uh, it's whatever your customers can tolerate. Uh, we talked a little bit about that, where it's take a look at their average abandon time, take a look at um, any correlation that you have to CSAT, find out where your customer's tolerance level is. You're absolutely right. 80-20 may not be the perfect fit for your particular contact center. So tune into your customer's behavior. What are they doing? When do you start to see those kinds of things drop off? Customer satisfaction drop, your abandon rate increase, and so on. Yeah, I think it kind of links as well to an important point that you made of kind of comparing, uh, see what impact your other metrics have, like abandon rate, and that will help guide you on SLA. So yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting point. Um, now we move on from to another question uh, uh, from Christy, and that is uh, we use service level and abandon, uh, abandon rate, which we monitor pretty closely. 
However, having uh, gone away from AHD, it's been a struggle to meet those as also having a huge push on uh, first time resolution. Our call center is small, less than 10 in the main queue. And if we have one person that takes, a person take our SL tanks, is, is service level a good measurement or should only be uh, should it only be an indicator? Sorry for butchering that question, Christy. Um, I don't know, uh, Karen, because you discussed this a little bit in your presentation, but I don't know if you have a clear answer to this one. Um, no, it's a tricky one, isn't it? And again, when you're a small contact centre, it does tend to make things harder and you do feel the impact of one less team member. Um, I think, you know, it go actually going back to Tiffany's point, what she just said, I think it's um, a really eloquently put point is that you've got to listen to your customers and, and use, drive your KPIs using the insight that you have. And actually, if you're really struggling to meet the um, existing KPIs that you have, what in particular are you struggling with and what impact if any is that having on your customers hmm. yeah i think that's uh yeah it's a very interesting point i think um yeah very uh very good and making sure that your metrics aren't contradicting one another is uh, is a key point uh in response to that um another a tip now in from uh Seema who says that it's important to link the key kpis with agent and team leader personal goals one of ours is zero complaints upheld uh, about agent behaviors. I think that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, tip there, Seema. And I see another one now coming from Grace also, who says, involve your team in setting up KPIs. It helps with engagement and commitment. I think that's also a very good tip in terms of kind of making sure that uh, agents know what's expected of them too. I don't know what your thoughts are on this tip, Tiffany. Um, I agree. I think that there are some measurements that are important in terms of understanding, again, that balance between customer experience and efficiencies. Um, but I think um, having them educate us about what their experience is with a customer to help define what is the right uh, level or the right area to be uh, focusing on, maybe a little more so than a different area, I think is important. You're right. It does help with engagement. Excellent. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think lots of, again, lots of uh, really great points. So covering lots of really interesting areas of uh, KPIs, which is great. Um, we've got a question now sent in from Dustin, who says, how do you track major incidents that spike your incoming contacts and thus impact your service levels? Um, I, I think, Tiffany, this is probably another one for, uh, for, uh, one for you. I, I will tell you, that is perhaps the most challenging um, <laughs> because uh, because when it happens, everyone's aware. But when you go back and you're looking at it historically, people forget. And so that is the number one thing that if I could solve in some kind of reporting system to be able to add notations for certain things, I would be uh, very wealthy. Um, it's something that I continue to try to investigate. Um, I think uh, the, the best that you can do is to try to at least make some kind of notation on anything that someone is consuming uh, to help them remember that this was the spike. Um, obviously, um, wanting to investigate where that spike came from so that it doesn't happen again, if possible, um, is important as well. So. Yeah, excellent. I think it's very interesting. Your service level, uh, start of your presentation about service levels seems to have really uh, struck a chord with our chat room and lots of interesting uh, debates going on there. Uh, and one kind of um, final tip uh, from Brianne is to identify your average time to abandon and set your service level uh, right for that time frame. I think that's an interesting one. I don't know, Katie, if you have any thoughts on this one. Yeah, I think it's a great tip. I, I think um, absolutely. And again, it's about listening, like what are your customers willing to tolerate? Um, and just going back to the last point that you made about, um, you know, incidents. I, I ran um, an incident recovery program in um, the, the credit the call center that I mentioned earlier. It was named ICE, Impacting Customer Events. And it's all around um, when issues and incidents happen and the recovery of those. Um, and actually that work I mentioned that's happening in October is all about that. So if you're interested in um, instant recovery and how to avoid it and how to fix it when it happens, it's worth joining. Excellent. Yeah, another piece of uh, really great advice. And uh, it's really great to uh, see everybody getting involved in the chat room. And I think it's provoked lots of interesting discussion. But unfortunately, that's all we do have time for today. So if in the chat room, you could just put in one or two words. Uh, what did you like best about the webinar? We always like uh, hearing your feedback. So uh, yeah, it'd be great if you could add that in there. And uh, we do have time for a winning tip. So a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates 
goes to uh, Jen today who says to coach the behavior and not the metric. A uh, very simple, but very, I think, important and great tip there from, uh, from Jen. So yeah, the congratulations and the bottle of champagne or box of chocolate. This is yours. Um, again, on the, th on the theme of uh, us liking feedback, if you could also complete the survey when you uh, leave the webinar. Um, yes, yeah, just four questions long, but again, we really appreciate uh, your feedback. And uh, also a quick reminder to you all that if you uh, really want to catch up on any of today's key learnings from the webinar, uh, just go to www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded dash webinars, and that will be available from that hyperlink uh, from this afternoon. Uh, also, make sure you uh, register for our other upcoming webinars in the series, and the link is at the bottom of your screen there, uh, simply www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash webinars. But all that's left for me to do is to say thanks to both our speakers today. So thank you for joining us today, Katie. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent stuff. And thank you for also joining us as well, Tiffany. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Excellent. Great. And uh, thanks to everybody for watching and we'll be back next week. So we'll see you then. Bye.